Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another fabulous episode of the Healthcare Trailblazers podcast. Excited to be sitting here today with Joffrey Roche. Uh, Joffrey's doing some interesting things in healthcare, but I like his title on LinkedIn most. So we're going to go with that. Joffrey is a son of a nurse and leading with heart and purpose. And so I love that. Joffrey, thanks so much for sitting with us today. Absolutely. Thanks for having me. So as a son of a nurse, this is, uh, it's kind of, uh, kind of gives it away a little bit, but why don't you take a step back and, um, where did you grow up and how did you get involved in healthcare? What was the inspiration? Yeah. So I actually grew up in Northeast Pennsylvania in the Poconos. Um, you know, I went to school there, graduated from high school, uh, Pleasant Valley, uh, high school. So I always make sure I highlight that, uh, not Pocono mountain. So go bears and, uh, you know, probably actually, four people, you know? <laughs> yeah, exactly. And, uh, and then, um, you know, obviously, uh, my mother was a nurse, served as a nurse in, uh, in that region, actually, at what was for many, many years, 100, 101 years, Pocono Health System, Pocono Medical Center. And then uh, fast forward, you know, I went to college, actually, at Moravian University in Bethlehem in the Lehigh Valley. Mm. And um, I had actually worked in politics and thought I was going to be, you know, entering full time uh, into politics. And when I, I was the politics in the Poconos? I, I did. I served, I actually served, uh, worked for a local state senator and a local state representative nice. uh, in the Poconos. And um, and then actually did a Capitol Hill internship. And when I did my internship, there was a lot a lot of interesting things that I was finding down on the Hill around my interest in like healthcare policy and how, you know, how we all need to be engaged there. And then actually, you know, obviously knew and heard, heard of healthcare all the time from my mom, um, but never really understood all the administrative opportunities that one could have in healthcare. And so one of my academic advisors said, well, why don't you do an internship? You, you know, you're pretty much done. You have an entire semester. Why don't you do an internship? So I did an internship at Lehigh Valley Health Network for an entire semester. And it was really during that internship where I fell in love with all the opportunities that one could have from a healthcare leadership standpoint. And so graduated in May of 2008 and landed my first job at Pocono Health System uh, initially as the community relations coordinator. That's fascinating. And um, so just transition from politics to you went from interning at Capitol Hill to interning at, at the uh, health system. Yeah, I mean, and come on, there's a lot of politics in healthcare, right? So there's uh, there's certainly, you know, you're, you're just really just switching out the characters in many ways. And yeah. so, uh, but, you know, I always tell people I was incredibly blessed to have started in a community regional healthcare system because I was fortunate to be in a role and have experience where I've got, I got to learn a lot of different things. Um, in fact, earlier today, I was I was texting with my former senior vice president, who's now retired, and it, you know I was reminiscing about all the different experiences I had in my almost ten years there, in a way that would be so different than if someone served in a larger system today. Hmm. That's fascinating. Can you uh, can you detail maybe some of those? Yeah. So I mean, you know, when you obviously when you serve in a regional community healthcare system or even a community hospital you tend to wear a lot of different hats. And for some people that could be really uncomfortable for, for someone like me that was a younger professional, it was truly the best of both worlds because while I had a dedicated role, I was blessed in that I had leaders who wanted to challenge me to take on new tasks and responsibilities. And so, you know, one of the first that I was part of was we were in the process of looking at building a new cancer center. Uh, as you, as you know, Northeast Pennsylvania has a higher cancer cancer incidence rate than a lot of Pennsylvania and actually a lot of the country. And so we had a, a small or, or am I hallucinating? No, it's yeah, certainly the impact of coal, hundred yeah. percent. Because obviously, you know, coal and, and the environmental effects, et cetera, have had huge impacts. And uh, and obviously it's been studied and well well known. And so, you know, we were we were just continuing to see that. And so we had a small eight thousand square foot cancer center that was a it was accredited as a comprehensive cancer center but we just couldn't keep up with the number of patients and so we you know began a process of looking at building a 60,000 square foot cancer wow. center and uh, I was part of the team uh, and as part of my responsibilities it was to survey patients get feedback from patients family members where do they want the cancer center to be hmm. ultimately that feedback came back and they said they wanted it to be on the hospital campus which meant we had to build a bridge that would connect the two buildings over a state road. Uh, and so that mean, meant I had to deal with PennDOT, uh, oh, Pennsylvania boy. Department of Transportation. And then I was part of the team that constructed it. And 
obviously it was a cancer center that won national awards for architecture and care. And, and so, you know, those experiences just were uh, unbelievable. That's awesome. I want to, I want to, I want to double click on that a little bit because there's a lot there as far as tying, um, tying innovation to the end user, um, which in this case is the patient. And I think that, I think that that might be somewhat unique. Um, so let's, 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 let's kind of dig into that process a little bit. Um, what was your, what was your, uh, what was the feedback process like? Um, I, I mean, even, even at taking a step before that, like, was it obvious to you that that was the route to take to start surveying patients and finding that out? Like even that I think is pretty interesting. Yeah. So let me just say that our president and CEO at the time was a nurse and was somebody who always said, you don't leave any meeting or conversation or make a decision without thinking about the end, the end user. And so she challenged every one of her executive management team members and certainly anybody that was doing work on her behalf to ensure that that was, was the foundation of everything. So really it was her, her just, you know, she made it clear, go out there and get this input. And certainly in the process, we wanted to make sure we heard from patients. We wanted to make sure we heard from family members or caregivers. We wanted to engage the American Cancer Society because of the daffodil days and, and, the, and the truck and, and all the work that they do to help transport patients. And we also wanted to, you know, just get input from everybody else because we knew that to make it work, we would have to do a lot of work on campus to also make it conducive to our patients. Ultimately then, you know, to your point, it was really a human-centered design type of project because throughout it, we would get architectures back and we would go back to our patients and go back to our family members and get their input on, are we truly building this in a way that would, would not just meet their needs clinically, but also meet their needs from a, from a psychological perspective. And so um, to this day, when I visit there, I'm always super pleased to, you know, drive by and visit that cancer center because it is, uh, first of all, one of the best lit facilities in the nation, uh, wow. won a lead award early on. Uh, I mean, it opened in 2012 and we were way ahead of most systems in, in lead. It also um, had a huge emphasis on the social and emotional aspect, not just for patients, but also for the staff. And so we have a, we put a room in there that was called the healing room. Okay. And you know, think about like burnout. This was a room that literally was just for meditation and it was developed again for patients, but also for staff. Because well, we I, know, I describe the room. The room was uh, one of the most calm spaces you could ever go in. It was developed to have couches and comfortable chairs, uh, beautiful art, uh, obviously not bright lights, very calming lights. Um, and it was it was outfitted by our facilities team so that you couldn't hear anything else outside. Uh, so when you were in that room, it was so quiet. And, you know, that was really important because one of the things we had at our cancer center and our hospital at the time was a complementary and alternative medicine program. And, you know, for those that aren't familiar, you know, these are really, really good programs that I think every healthcare organization should have because it was things like stress management, but also things like Reiki and other uh, healing, you know, type of, uh, of solutions. And so we ran a lot of programs out of that for both patients, staff, family members, et cetera, all about their healing journey. Yeah. Is that, that's, Yeah. And it's, 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 it's interesting that you, that you loop staff into that as well, because I think most people would consider that to be separate buckets, but I think you're right. Um, I mean, you know, staff at these, um, at the cancer facility or some, or any really healthcare facility, um, they go through, they go through a lot. They have to witness, you know, they have to witness a lot. They have to go through a lot. And, um, you know, everyone thinks that all healthcare professionals are, they just become, you know, desensitized, you know, desensitized and nothing really gets past them, but. Sounds like you, you, you think different. A hundred percent. Look, I think we have for so long in many ways, you know, look for years, you know, during COVID, for example, many people would call our healthcare professionals, those in the workforce heroes. Right. And then as soon as COVID started to uh, become divisive, uh, violence among and against healthcare workers increased and they yeah. were no longer heroes because then they right. were pushing a vaccine or pushing public health. And uh, the reality of it is, is that there's, there's no industry 
across the across the the world that um, has a very very difficult job to do. Um, I always tell people if you haven't seen the new Stanford uh, uh, medical school video around empathy, it's so important to watch because it is a great representation of what our healthcare professionals have to face. I mean, you think about it, you have, you have all ends, right? I mean, you've got the, the birth to death, and then you've got so much in between. And um, it's not an easy industry, but, but if we keep our human uh, centered, centered aspects at the front, we certainly have a better chance of, of taking care of our patients, but also taking care of our colleagues. And ultimately, our colleagues are our patients, if we want to be honest about it. Yeah. Uh, I want to ask you one last question on the, the patient centered architecture. Uh, was there anything that, that you can recall that stood out, um, as maybe interesting or not intuitive to you that during that process, like, was there, was there something that from the specific patient feedback, uh, was surprising to you that you would not have done that you can remember? I, that was a while ago. Hmm. You know, not on the cancer center project, but. You know, probably another project that comes to mind where patient feedback was important, and you'll get a theme here, you know, we didn't do anything without our feedback from our patients. We had um, we had a 90,000 visit emergency room. Um, and I'm sure you've been into Poconos. Uh, 90,000 visits a year into at the time what was, you know, somewhere around a 20 something bed emergency room oh my goodness. 27 if I remember correctly or maybe it was either 27 or 30 that was our Achilles heel for many many years uh, many patients were taken care of in the hallway our throughput was abysmal but at the same time we had so many visits and the staff were almost always burnt out and, you know, we went through a process where I will remember we, we would get all this patient feedback. We would review it. We would talk with them. And I'll never forget a moment where we received some feedback from a patient that said, you know, you have this extra waiting room uh, that comes into essentially an adjacent entrance, but not the entrance to the emergency room. Okay. Do you really need that space or could you leverage it? to think about more patient care space. Hmm. And so, you know, it's funny, right? I mean, this was a building that was built to house the emergency room and then above it, a heart and vascular institute, uh, ICU, CVCU, et cetera. And um, so I'll never forget this. Our senior, my senior vice president and I, he, he looked at me and he said, go get the director of facilities. He said, we're going to go on a walk. And uh, we just literally walked. And, you know, we walked the entire space and uh, walked the entire emergency room. And we embarked on a project uh, with an interdisciplinary team of the emergency room, patient relations, ourselves, et cetera, and used this feedback that, you know, should have been obvious, honestly. But, you know, we were so used to that space as being another entrance to the hospital that we didn't necessarily think of it as could we give that up? Because, you know, the other entrance to the hospital was was quite a bit of distance of walking up a hill. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, by doing so, would we give up this other a little bit easier entrance? So ultimately, what we ended up doing was was um, we redeveloped based on the feedback. We redeveloped the entrance to the hospital. Wow. And so we kept the one, but we knew that one was not going to be ultimately the best for for patients who didn't have the best mobility. Mm -hmm. And so we redeveloped. We took valet parking. And instead of having valet in that entrance, we moved valet actually over to the cancer center because the cancer center was so big that we could uh, avoid having anyone enter the cancer area by easily just having them come in and go up the elevator and go right up the bridge and go over. And so we redeveloped everything. Wow. And um, ultimately, we were able to create 13 new patient beds in the emergency room, uh, which ultimately still wasn't going to meet all the needs. But it also allowed us to create space for a pediatric space in the emergency room, uh, more space for families uh, and visitors when they uh, had family members in the emergency room. And, um, you know, certainly, again, another thing that both staff and, and 
patient family feedback helped fuel the innovation? I'm so happy. I, I'm so happy I asked that question. That was a that that was a phenomenal story. That's 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 awesome. What yeah. um, what 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 tips can you give to people for actually getting? <laughs> you described as if that was all very simple. Um, like, all right, so we got the feedback, and then you know we got the the, the, the key stakeholders together. We took a walk and we read <laughs> and we redeveloped it. Um, I feel like things don't actually move that smoothly in, in real life. And you know, when you have multiple stakeholders and it just, it just compounds and it gets so, so confusing, uh, from a system or a process perspective, what advice would you give to a, a, a health system on how to better take action and maybe in a quicker, more efficient way? Yeah. Look, I mean, everything has a process and even the way I describe it to your point, right? I mean, there still was a process. Yeah. Um, even after that walk, we still had to get buy-in from the executive leadership team. We had to get buy-in ultimately from the board because it was a capital project and had significant facility um, infrastructure changes. But but ultimately what it comes down to is to that earlier point that I said where our president and CEO always said, keep, in, keep at the foundation those that we serve. And so I think um, healthcare, as you know, is so complex but I think we have to come back to those things all the time. How is this truly going to be in the best interest of our patients? And then secondly, uh, and I, I shouldn't really say secondly, I should say congruently, how is this also going to help our staff? Because ultimately, if it doesn't help our staff, it's not going to help our patients because they're the ones that have to be there providing that care. And we know their impact uh, on patient care is profound. And so we have to make sure that that is a congruent uh, parallel in everything that we do. I will tell you that in all my time in healthcare, having been in a hospital administration role, uh, which was still to this day, uh, the best experience and the best job I ever had. And then obviously traveling the country and work that I do at Siemens, uh, as well as having served in academia. Healthcare has so much opportunity for innovation, but we tend to be so risk averse. We tend to be so afraid to try things. We tend to have kind of older way of thinking. And we tend to want to put things through a process that just by the time it comes out, you lost all the excitement. And I was just blessed to be in a culture where, yeah, there were some people who were, you know, sometimes you would just be like, are you kidding me? Uh, it's probably why I lost my hair, right? But, but there were also people like my CEO, my senior vice president, who I was saying I was texting with earlier, who, what I learned from them, and it will stay with me my rest of my life, was follow who you're there to serve. And don't ever bend on that. And I will remember many, many experiences where many departments from compliance, risk management, a whole litany, legal, would just kind of want to take out all the excitement out of a project we were looking at. And sometimes for good reasons, we got to be safe. We've got to be of quality. We've got to be legal. All, absolutely. But there's a, there's a fine line between at the end of the day, if it, it, as my senior vice president used to say to the lawyers, he would say, unless you can identify and articulate to me where the legal issue is, I want you to just contribute, but I don't want you to be the roadblock. And, you know, and they would throw up a couple things and he'd say, okay, keep going. Cause I'm not hearing it. And they would go, oh, keep going. I'm not hearing it. And then eventually he'd say, we're going cause you didn't articulate it. And we need leadership that is going to do that. Because if I look back, there were many things that we did that ultimately were, were true patient focused decisions that would not have happened if we listened to risk management, would not have happened even at times if we listened to the operations team. And I think that's the key when you're on the strategy, the transformation side is you've got to be willing to push, push, push with data, science, and art and be able to tell those stories. And I'll tell you, one of the things I learned from him was doctors love stories, clinicians love stories. They love to be part of that solution. And so there were many times where even our operations, I can remember even our COO at times, oh, we can't do that. Okay. And so he would say, no problem. And he would tell me, 
go get me a story. So we'd go out. We would talk to the clinic, clinical team. We would talk to patients. We'd bring that back. And things would change. Because the reality of it is, is we would come back to that foundation. Man, <laughs> there's so many good good bits of, of, of what you just said. Uh, the, the YouTube shorts team is going to have a very easy work with this one. Um, that was, that was fantastic. Uh, and, and so important. And I love, you know, it's, it's a very Bezos, be how do you say, like very Bezos minded, uh, view, which usually tech views don't really translate over to healthcare, but that's, you know, like he's famously all about, you know, obsessed about the customer, obsessed, you know, obsessed about the customer. And, um, I think you're right. I think if we can get, I think if we can get more focus and more obsession about the patient and about the, uh, even, and, and the staff, and I don't think those two things conflict. I think they're both different end users, right? And so there's patient spaces and that's really the foundation because the patient, the facility is there to care for the patient, but then there's the people that are off operating that space. And there's yep. definitely a whole bunch to be thought about. Just like, should we put the coffee station here or here or here? And, you know, um, yep. and to your point that directly impacts the, the patients, you know, like I, I was at a, I was at a hospital last week and, um, and it seemed very well laid out. And it was like, obvious, like you open the door to your room and there was like specific nurses that were right there. And, you know, um, yeah. So I think that's fantastic. I wish we can, I, I, I wish we can bridge more of that gap when it comes to policy, because to your point, the read, the underlying reason around why there's so many, you know, naysayers and, um, roadblocky people in each healthcare organization, as far as like, you know, legal and compliance and you know is is because there's so much regulation around healthcare and i and 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 i i i don't know i as i as i as i do this i i find myself day by day feeling like they don't that the people that are actually creating policy don't have a keen understanding of of the end user and the end purpose i think it just gets displayed by every everything that gets put out and it's unfortunate i think yeah well, well i think i think you you know you're 100 percent right i mean and i always tell people you can't talk about the social determinants of health without also talking about the political determinants of health yeah because at the end of the day everything from a social determinants of health perspective is impacted by the politics of it yep to your, our earlier conversation right the the idea that that the history and the industry of coal had an impact to create more incidents in cancer. Well, there was a decision years ago in Northeast PA that that was going to be the industry and all that work occur. But as time goes on, the environmental impacts and effects of that have caused a lot more cancer. Yeah. Um, and, and again, yes, I know, uh, you know, people don't want to talk about those things because all oh, we, you know, we don't want to get rid of coal uh, in the United States uh, and those things, but you've got to understand the impacts and the effects of those things. Right. And and I think you're right from a regulation standpoint. We, um, I think, you know, in our at my former healthcare system, we always said, you know, quality, quality and patient experience are synonymous. They are always linked. So is safety. But but if if there's nothing that limits or inhibits that, then the decision should be to go forward, um, because ultimately, quality, patient safety, patient care, they're all linked. And, uh, and then obviously experience is linked to all that as well. Um, right. and you can't do any of that if you don't have the same level of commitment to the team and, and their right. colleagues around us. Right. Yeah. Spot on. So let's, let's talk, let's, uh, let's talk about, um, let's talk about your, your current work at Siemens. What, uh, what are you doing over there? Yeah. Yeah. So I'm, I, you know, I have the privilege of serving in an inaugural role, uh, first ever time Siemens has had this role, at least on the healthcare side, very much focused on, you know, how do we really give, uh, give thought to, strategy to, and implement around building next generation healthcare workforce. And so obviously people are like, well, that's an interesting role and that's an interesting uh, space to be in for Siemens, right? But Siemens actually for quite a while here in North America, US and Canada has had, and even globally we do as well, an educational workforce solutions team that is focused on helping uh, the technologists and folks in lab, med, med lab techs, uh, as well as even in the oncology space, uh, radiation therapists, et cetera, through Varian, because Varian is a Siemens Health and Years company, uh, further grow in their careers. 
uh, make sure that they're doing the best that they can to ultimately impact patients. And so my role is entirely focused on kind of building out that next generation of workforce, working with our hospitals and healthcare systems, uh, working with our community colleges, our colleges and universities, uh, working with government, uh, to your earlier point, um, certainly uh, contributing around thought leadership, partnerships, thinking about how to apprenticeships change the current uh, composition of our healthcare workforce. Sure. At the same time, also thinking about how we need to keep diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging uh, at the cornerstone of all this, because we still have a healthcare workforce that does not reflect the patients that we serve. It's the true reality. And so, uh, you know, I know some states and, and some folks want to not talk about those issues, but we know that health equity matters and you can't achieve health equity if you don't have that connection from the clinician to the patient. Uh, and we've got data, you know, whether it's maternal mortality, uh, whether it's diabetes, uh, whether it's COPD, whether it's law, I mean, everything, when you've got that connection from a clinician to a patient and understanding their unique culture, their unique health risks, that some people just have different health risks than others, we're not going to advance health equity. Yeah. And uh, we're not also going to advance health literacy. And so a lot of that work as well. Yeah. Um, I don't know if you caught this part, but um, I, uh, I, I recently had Mark Cuban on and we, we kind of, he's been getting in a lot of back and forth with Elon and different people on Twitter about DEI and it's been a lot of fun. And so I ended up having an unplanned 40 minute debate on DEI with him, um, with his, with him, you know, it, I, I wouldn't say we, it wasn't two. It wasn't two opposing sides. I'd say, but I was definitely uh, the pushback, and he was the push for. Um, and it was really fun. It was really, really fun. I think he enjoyed it. I definitely enjoyed it. Um, and I think it was a meaningful, honest conversation. Definitely recommend checking it out, whether you agree or not. Um, but to your I'm, point, well, I'd be on the Mark Cuban side. You would be. Well, I. You know what? The funny yeah. thing is, by the end of my conversation, I don't think Mark Cuban is on the Mark Cuban side. Um, and so, no, like, honestly, I think that he, I think that, and we kind of clarified this at the end where he basically differentiated, you know, what he calls activists from, from actual DEI. And in short, in short, what the DEI that Mark is, uh, is a proponent of, I, 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 I think it would be very hard to find somebody that would not be a proponent of the same DEI. And that DEI is exactly what you're talking about. And I think healthcare is a fantastic example, to your point, of why DEI is so important in a real sense. Because you're yeah. absolutely correct. There are cultural, um, there are cultural understandings of healthcare. There's religious aspects to healthcare. There's community, zip code based. You know, there's so many. There's so many. You know, uh, there's so many parts of our life that are not reflected in possibly my problem list in my EHR that contribute to the way I view healthcare, right? Whether it comes to which vac you know, vaccines and education and access, and there's so many different things. And at the end of the day, um, there's an extremely, I'm not going to say it's impossible, but there's an extremely low chance that I, as a 27 year old, you know, Jewish Orthodox person living in Northeast Pennsylvania will understand the experience of the 67 year old African American living in the Bronx. Like there's just, yep. you know, and, um, and so I, 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 I'm all about it uh, in that in that regard, a hundred percent. So going going back to the Cuban thing, I I think that's what he's a proponent of, and I think that that uh, I th I don't think anyone would disagree with him. I think that the thing that people are disagreeing with, he also disagrees with, and I think that that's something that is more activist DEI than 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 anything else, and that's where I think more shallow and um, and um, you know superficial elements uh, are just checked off, you know, um, to, 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 to check off basically what DEI just becomes for the sake of DEI and not for the sake of the patient and not for the sake of the business, and not for the sake of yeah. the experience. That's where I think it gets, it gets different. But, um, uh, well, and, point, and it, you know, yeah. the thing that I do, the, the thing I will say there that is important to acknowledge and certainly also understand, and, and there's been some incredible work done in this space is healthcare by and far historically and traditionally was was not developed for everybody i okay, mean if you go on. back in time yeah. and really understand how it was built it was really built for individuals that had had the finances to 
to afford it. And so systemically, we do have a system that was not built for everybody. And so that that piece, um, you know, to your point, I, I never advocate for, uh, you know, just to say something to say something. But I will say that's one of the reasons why systemically we'll, we've had a lot of challenges with, like, with an issue like maternal mortality. Because if you look at even medical education, for many years, we weren't really educating and training on all the differences that one culture, one race has versus another. And so, you know, I think what people have to remember, and I think unfortunately DEI gets a bad rap and has now become politicized, which I think is extremely sad. Uh, Because to your point, it is really about community. And it's also about understanding community. And it goes all ways. Uh, You know, I'm a German American. You know, my family was born in Germany. Uh, There's things that I have to understand about that, both culturally uh, and from a health perspective, because there are things we're actually predisposed to. Um, And so, but it needs to be understood in the system. But at the same time, I also know that other colleagues and other, you know, individuals are going to have higher risk for certain things that I'm not going to have a higher risk for. And there does have to, there has to be evidence-based protocols on how to deal with that. We're still working towards that. Yeah. Um, you know, in this system, we are not so, all there yet. Okay. So let me like, I'd, I'd love to clarify. I don't think this is pushback necessarily, but I don't, I don't, it sounds like you kind of want to have it both ways, which is, is the answer to include representation from the smaller demographic community so that you can essentially use that that representative as a bridge right or is the answer to educate the entire system on 14 million different mini cultures within the united states you know to me i think it's at least in my experience and and certainly work that i've done I would say that it's there, there's a piece of both, right? So I'll give you an example that I think will articulate that. Northeast Pennsylvania, when I served at Pocono, we were we were faced uh, at a period of time with an example that I think will articulate this. Um, I was once at an event in the community, and a uh, member of the LGBTQ plus community came over to me and said, um, "I want to tell you some recent experiences in the emergency room." that uh, would not necessarily be inclusive care. And as I learned about it and brought it to the medical staff, brought it to the emergency room leadership, it was clear that that from a cultural competence perspective, we had opportunities to do better. And so uh, I looked at that from the vantage point of education as well as training. And so at the time, actually, what I did was I worked with our medical staff to then bring then Dr. Rachel Levine uh, into our campus. And, you know, obviously Dr. Levine is our assistant secretary of health in, in the federal government now. At the time, she was our physician general. And Dr. Levine came up and did a phenomenal training with physicians and clinicians and nurses and others around what and how we could do better. And that's exactly how you address this. It's all about education and training. And I will tell you, there were some naysayers in the beginning when we first did it. But you know what? Those naysayers became some of our biggest advocates uh, after it because they saw how that work led to better care and a better experience for those who were saying it wasn't. And so that's how I have always seen it. Yeah. Yeah. It's it's definitely a fascinating discussion. And we should definitely do this with three hours and uh, a bottle of alcohol, which would be a lot more entertaining. It's a, it's a second podcast I want to start, which is doctors and drinks. Just like sit down and just go <laughs> rogue in this. Uh, but, uh, but definitely, a, definitely that is a, not a podcast that I listen to, <laughs> <laughs> but the doctors and drinks, you would, right? Uh, absolutely. I always, always want to talk about anything that we can do to advance, advance healthcare forward. Right, right, right. But not uh, Seth Rogen, yeah. that, that, that for sure. Yeah. Um, but, uh, but yeah, um, I think, I think that definitely, uh, when it comes to, when it comes to, to healthcare, it's a very obvious case of, uh, of why, of why, uh, an understanding of the demographic that you're trying to serve is good, you know, yeah. um, where I think we can kind of get into the weeds is whether now you start, whether now you start kind of projecting, you know, a minority's, um, 
opinion of good care across a larger demographic. And I think that that's something that we're seeing. And I think that's a mistake. Um, like I, as an Orthodox Jew would not, would not, uh, feel compelled to have Geisinger changed her standards overall, um, mm -hmm. to, to reflect me. What I would hope yep. in my own care though, on a personal level is that I would have that, that understanding with somebody. Right. And I think we yep. do that actually. And I, and, and this really comes down to also like personal accountability and being yep. your own advocate. Like at the end of the day, we have to, we have to reconnect. And this is a, this is actually a theme that I've been through in the last couple of podcasts with people for some reasons come up, but like we have to reconnect people with their own care, like with their own health, yep. right? Somebody who, uh, my last guest, his name is Alex. Uh, uh, and uh, he, he, he had a really good line. He said like, everybody obsesses about health care and it's time to reobsess about just health. <laughs> like, yep. you know, like let's be, let's, let's go back there. And I think that, you know, be your own advocate and like, you know, use your head and, um, you know, uh, uh, it, it's, uh, it's interesting. We have, you know, that the, this, our, our community's, uh, leader, he's a, a very famous rabbi and he would always tell people that, um, had any medical questions or, med you know, to, to him that you should go speak to a doctor who's also a friend. Right. Mm -hmm. Um, and it was interesting because I happened to see a clip this week where somebody asked him, uh, a, a medical question for their son and he's, and that's the advice he gave. And then the se the secretary turned to 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 this rabbi and said, "This person himself is a doctor. Like the father of the child was a doctor." And, no. the, and, and the rabbi said, "No, no, that's not that's not good because you're emotionally involved. You need to find a yeah. doctor who can be neutral, but also as a friend, because as a friend, they will have all the context to DEI's point around yeah. your specific, not just your cultural understandings, but like yeah. your specific understandings, right?" Yeah. Um, and so I think, yeah, I think definitely like be your own advocate and, and, um, and, and, and go find the, um, yeah. go find, go, fi go, go find somebody in healthcare that you can, that you can trust. Yeah. Really now the key though, in what you just said is be your own advocate. Not everybody can always be their own advocate. And that's the piece we have to remember too, when you talk about social determinants. And that's why we have to make sure we've got a system that can also advocate for others. So um, why, why can't I be my own advocate? Describe no, who I am that I can't. You can, you can yeah. describe, our... who, describe like who would the person, who would I be if I were the person that could not like describe yeah. that? person. Yeah. Well, I think like, I mean, you look at it like today, right? I mean, if you're, if you're somebody who's in a healthcare system as a patient and you don't, and you don't even understand, you know, or never have had experience with, with healthcare or medicine, you sometimes in our system, you can really struggle without an advocate. Uh, I'll give you my own personal example. You know, I, I was, you know, somebody who worked in hospital administration for many, many years, but I had a clinical issue that went on for many, many years. And uh, my mother was my advocate. And if I didn't have her, it's possible that I wouldn't be here on this very podcast today because, you know, I had, I had a condition called sinus bradycardia where I would just faint. And ultimately, you know, they would think, oh, it's just because he's got a runner's heart or sometimes it was, oh, he must have been drinking too much. And ultimately, my heart rate would just plummet very, very low. That's crazy. And it's a very this is actually a more common condition than people realize. And I'm not old. I'm a younger guy. Yeah. And um, my mother was my advocate. And if I didn't have her in those meetings, in those consultations, telling the doctors, challenging the doctors, challenging the team, mm -hmm. um, I may not have had the same experience. And so. What I learned in that experience is, and again, we were a family that was, you know, had insurance and had good, uh, you know, upbringing, et cetera, is I learned a lot about that importance of advocate. And I think to your point earlier, that's why I always tell people there's a difference in the discussion around health equity from those who are calling for health equality. Health equality will never happen because you can't have equality in healthcare because you've got different cultures, different yeah. ethnic backgrounds, but you can have health equity. And that's the difference between education, understanding, empathy, you know, cultural competence, all those types of things. And I think that's where we have to always remind everybody, this is not an equality discussion. This is about health equity. And the yeah. same thing is in workforce. Um, and it's why, you know, if we can have more clinicians, more colleagues that can both, re you know, both represent, listen, look like, identify yeah. with, we will have a much better system. Right, 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 right. Um, yeah, kind of looping all the way back back around uh, to, to the value-based care discussion. I also believe from from a, from an equity perspective, the best way to get there is through 
is through value-based care and taking risk. Because if I take risk, then I my sole incentive is the patient's outcome. And that forces me to think in a, in a, in a, in a patient-facing way. And it forces me to think, why is this demographic in this area just not having good outcomes? Right. Yeah. And it forces me to explore those things. Um, and, yeah. if, and, and it's also a good way of mitigating bad DEI, so to speak, because bad DEI and just having groups and representation for, for the, the, the purposes of having groups of representation that, you know, is not going to help my patient's outcome. Right. Um, I, I have, I have a hard time, you know, I have a hard time. Thinking, that term. <laughs> I have a hard time thinking there's bad DEI. Right. I mean, look, like, I think um, I think it has become such a politically charged issue, which saddens me uh, deeply uh, because yeah. uh, it shouldn't be. Um, and I think those that have caused it uh, will one day look in the mirror and realize that what they did was was really attack the idea of community. Um, but but what I do agree with you on a hundred percent is value based care is so critical here, and and it's it's so frustrating to think we still aren't there. Yeah, um, we should be there. And I think why I like the idea of connecting health equity and and, and uh, value based care too is the care coordination side of it. Um, I can remember that, you know, even at Pocono back in the day, we had developed service lines earlier on than a lot of systems. And one of the things we had in our service lines was we had navigators, we had a yeah. navigator in oncology, but by by service, so breast, yeah. lung, we had navigators in cardiac. We had navigators in chronic care and medicine. And um, we were kind of ahead of the curve at the time. And we weren't getting reimbursed for that, mind you. But what so we why, knew... Why would you do that then? Why did we do it? Yeah. Because we knew it was in the best interest of the patients. And we knew that we could mitigate, we could absolutely mitigate things that would become far worse and end up in the emergency room by doing that. So I'll give you an example. We launched a phenomenal remote program, remote monitoring program. Yep. Um, it was actually called our Health Coaches Program, our Community Care Network. Nice. It was a pilot at the time. Blue Cross, at the time, Blue Cross NEPA funded it. They provided the telemedicine remote monitoring. But we leveraged medical students from Commonwealth Medical College, which is Geisinger's now, pharmacy students from Wilkes University, and public health students from ESU. And those, those students undergrad and grad and doctoral uh, would visit patients who were super utilizers to our emergency room and COPD, diabetes, etc. They were connected when they'd go out to our doctor, our nurse via telemedicine, and they would literally be there to talk to them about their discharge, how they're supposed to carry on forward to avoid them being readmitted. Our CFO agreed to do it as a pilot. It was so successful. It, it, it has, you know, went on for, for many years and ultimately, you know, we had a navigator um, and, you know, leveraging students, we actually reduced readmissions. But again, we were not getting reimbursed for that. It was an innovative right. project funded by an insurance company, right. um, but had profound impact for the patients and honestly, better for us too. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Well, um, you're definitely someone that, that would just keep and keep chatting, but uh, we are up on time. Uh, Joffrey, this was, this was a lot of fun. Thanks so much for spending time today. And uh, where can people find you? I know LinkedIn, you're pretty active on LinkedIn. Uh, where else yeah, you? absolutely on LinkedIn. Always happy to connect. Incredible. Well, thanks. Thanks for your time. Yep. You're welcome. Thank you.